when we were making Hill Street Blues, a, a, a woman came to see me who was a Broadway producer. She had a, a proposal for me that I thought was very intriguing, which was to take Hill Street Blues to Broadway as a musical. And I thought, gee, that's, that's an audacious concept. And I went up to see Arthur Price, uh, who, who then was the head of uh, MTM, after Grant Tinker had left, and he he shot the the idea down for all kinds of reasons that were probably valid. And hey, hey, yeah. let's be careful out there. Let's be careful out there. But the idea stuck in my head for years afterwards, you know, and, and when I finally had this 10 episode commitment from ABC for, for all those shows, I thought, well, you know, what am I gonna do, make 10 versions of the same thing? Let's be bold, let's take some chances. And hearkening back to that original idea, uh, I thought, well, if I can't take a cop show to Broadway, what if I bring Broadway to a cop show? This ain't a question of black or white. It's a plain, simple matter of blue. Yeah. What kind of world do we live in? Every single person I told the idea to just thought it was a terrible idea. <laughs> Poor Bob Iger, you know, who ran ABC in those days. He said, I always wanted a cop show from you, but, but a musical cop show? I want this jail. I want it fast. Yes, ma'am. Everybody sort of indulged this fantasy that I had of making this thing. Uh, I, I, I got a hold, I'd never met him before, I got a hold of Randy Newman. Days of sunshine, tears and rain. I think Randy is arguably the best songwriter of our generation. You know, a remarkable, gifted guy. And so to have five Randy Newman songs in, in this pilot, and Greg Hoblet just directed the hell out of it. Um, it had some really, really, really extraordinary moments in it, I thought. Um, and I knew we weren't going to have Randy Newman every episode, and so that clearly the, not just in terms of the level of talent of our songwriters, but the lack of time in which to really develop them properly was going to cost us something in terms of overall quality. And it did. You know, I don't think the songs in subsequent episodes were anything nearly as, as compelling as what Randy wrote. Step up, chop. Let's see what you got. Let's see what you don't got. be coming for you, Randy, or not. Tomorrow morning, we're going to be you free. So you better be watching your back. In the street. Get in the car. We the power. No, we we the car. He came to meet me, and we had a meeting. And I told him the idea, and he said, it's terrible. <laughs> it'll, ne it'll never work. And I talked him into it. And then I went to Mike Post, um, who was our composer for Hill Street and L.A. Law, and, you know. And we were very good friends. I told him the idea. He said, you're nuts. <laughs> you know? um, but I just believed in it. I, I thought, you know, let's give it a try. One of the conventions of, of television storytelling is that, at, at least in, in my body of work over, over the years, is that it's real. I mean, I've never done science fiction or, you know, vampires or space operas or anything like that. You know, 
cop shows, law shows, medical shows. Um, always try to be as realistic as, you, as we can be. Um, and I think certainly by 1990, with the success that I'd, I'd had with three other television series, there, there was a certain expectation regarding the realistic portrayal of cops and lawyers and doctors. And as long as we were going to be making a musical cop show, I think I just wanted to tell our audience from the outset that this is going to be different, that this was a musical. And, and I couldn't have imagined any, anyone better to sort of make that statement for us than Randy. That was a very conscious um, choice to sort of wave our flag and to say, you know, this is what we're doing. William Finkelstein, Billy Finkelstein, is a wonderful writer and he came to work with me and David Kelly and, and, and our group on LA, right from the beginning of LA Law. And uh, he was a, a really talented guy and a, and a wonderful friend. And, you know, I thought, come on, let's do this together. Billy and I wrote the pilot together. When you're doing a television series, notwithstanding the occasional emergence of, of a star like David Kelly, who was known for his ability to go in a room and come out two days later with a script. I mean, I couldn't do that. I could never do that. And the nature of, of our agreement with, with, with ABC was to provide them with 10 television series over seven years. So there's no way, given that timeline, that you could afford the luxury of saying, all right, let's sit and write all 13 episodes, if you will, um, which is the standard first season commitment, before we shoot. Now, you know, you, the network presses the button, and you've made your pilot, and you assemble your writing staff, and you start. Then you give yourself about a three-month head start, if you can. Uh, in those days, it's probably a little less, because shows, shows would get programmed in May, and you'd have to go into production end of July. So, you know, it was like, 10, 10 to 12 weeks of, of prep time. And we would just be writing like crazy. And, you know, we would probably start principal photography on, on the series episodes. And if we were lucky, we'd have three or four scripts on the table. Uh, but by then, we would pretty much have a concept of where we were going so that we weren't thrashing around in, in, in the dark in terms of what stories we, we wanted to tell. And so for me, I, I always felt that my first responsibility was story. Because to me, that's the heavy lifting in television, is coming up with coherent, smart, engaging, emotionally relevant stories. Uh, and if the stories are really strong and you have a group of writers that you trust, you're going to get great scripts. Um, so I felt my, my ability to, to, you know, choreograph story was my primary responsibility. My second responsibility as necessary was to uh, do a lot of rewriting, which I did, uh, which I never took credit for. Um, and that the least effective use of my time 
would be to go off and write originals. Because if I'm off writing originals, what's everybody else in the room doing? There's, there's nobody running the ship, you know? And I've heard too many stories over the years of writers' rooms that were rudderless because the boss was never there. You know, the boss was off writing his own thing or her own thing, and all these other writers are sitting around with their thumbs up their butts going, well, what are we supposed to do? So as much as I love writing, and I've found ways over the years to to do my own writing. Uh, when it comes to television, first and foremost is get the stories right. Detective Potts was in the room at the time. I'll need immunity for him and Lieutenant Ralph Ruskin in order to make a murder case against LaRusso. We can do that. Murder. In another age, he would have ridden back into town, gotten himself a shave, a haircut, a bath, and a whore. It's a regrettable situation, Chief. This was an interesting dilemma uh, when we were casting the pilot of Cop Rock because, A, I didn't want to hire voices to pre-record for actors. I wanted actors who could sing. The standards were very high vocally, um, you know, between Mike Post and Randy Newman. Um, I was happy to trust their judgment about the quality of, of musicianship and, and vocal skills. In many cases, and I don't want to name particular actors for obvious reasons, but in, in, in many cases, we hired actors that if not for their vocal skills, I wouldn't have hired because ultimately we felt that if we didn't have real credibility vocally with, with, with our characters, then, then we would fail, for sure. Um, and so in certain ways we compromised because we needed two separate talents wrapped in one package and you know that that sort of lengthens the odds of finding an ensemble where everyone has a, a professional level vocal talent along with a professional level acting talent so we made certain compromises in you know in in casting the ensemble because in the final analysis I lean by and large I lean more towards vocal ability I can't believe it's so strange somehow I've come so far don't stop seat of a musical by almost by definition is that everybody up there can sing their asses off you know um, and we didn't want to compromise that if we if we were going to embrace the conceit of, of making a musical then we we felt the voices had to be on a par The most complicated part of cop rock was the technical aspect of it. Uh, how do you make a real musical on a television budget and a television schedule? And we figured it out. We, Mike Post figured it out. Uh, because one of the things that, that I, I wanted to make sure was that all of our performances were live. And so we wound up with this enormous sound truck outside of the soundstage. 
And we literally recorded these songs live. I wanna go I think we probably had live playback and, uh, and the vocals on stage. We didn't have, you know, a rock band or, or whatever. The vocals were live. When we were shooting the pilot, we had this incredibly elaborate s song sequence in a courtroom, and the song is called He's Guilty. I want to thank the jury. Anderson was the judge in the courtroom and sang, you know, a significant piece of that song that Randy wrote called, he's, you know, he's guilty. And, and the, the jury in that sequence morphed into a gospel choir. I mean, it was just, it was great. I loved it. it took us all night to shoot it. You know, Randy wrote five songs for the show, for the pilot. And they were all wonderful. They were, they were really terrific. Sort of a rap uh, uh, opening number, a couple of ballads, and this courtroom uh, song, which was so elaborate in its production elements, but it was, it was just great. And, uh, and then this, this beautiful haunting song that he wrote for the very end of the piece uh, that, that uh, Kathleen Will Hoyt sang, which was wonderful, really wonderful. After Randy, uh, who was not going to stay with the series, he just wrote the five songs for the pilot. We, Mike Post, employed a group of songwriters. I think we had four or five songwriters, and and what I did was I included them in our story meetings, so that they became an extension of our writing group, and. I approached it essentially as I would any other show, a cop show, a law show. You know, what are our stories? You know, who's featured in this? You know, what's the? What are all the elements that that we that we want in the story? And then we would try to identify essentially five scenes that could be played out in song. And what you wanted were scenes that really drove the action in some fundamental way. Um, and with, with our songwriters, as part of our group, I mean, they were immersed in not only the individual episodes, but in the flow of the entire storyline, because um, there were ongoing elements to the, to the stories. And then once we identified what we wanted those five songs to be about and, and where we spotted them in the story structure, they'd go off and write. And, uh, you know, Mike Post supervised that process. Um, and then and it would be like having scripts come in, first draft scripts. So, if, you know, a first draft song would come in and Either we loved it or we didn't like it or we liked some of it and, you know, and then they'd go back and fix and redo. It was a grueling schedule, you know, just complicated uh, in, in terms of fitting all the, these elements uh, in, into one hour of television and having all these writers, you know, script writers, song writers. But once we mastered the process, and we did, I mean, we pretty much came up with systems and got the process going and, and realized that we could actually 
pretty much make this thing, on, you know, on, on a TV schedule. I thought, in like Flynn. Oh I really thought that this was such an original idea and such a unique approach that if we could actually figure out the physical challenges of it, I knew I could, I knew I could make a good cop show. You gonna read me my rights or what? And I thought the music would really just make it different and special and focus emotions in a unique way. It had never been done before. This year's winners of the LAPD Medal of Valor. You honor me with glory. I'm proud to heed the call. But if one of us is a hero, then we're heroes all. And of course, it was a disaster. It, it was an absolute disaster. I, I, I think audiences rejected it before we, we ever went on the air. I mean, it wasn't like, gee, this is such a curious, interesting idea. Let's let's give it a try, and you know, and then it goes down from there. Nobody even tuned in practically. I, I, I mean, it, it was. I think people were actually turned off by the concept. By the, by the promotional material, by however they were, you know, doing it, you know, the promotional ads on, you know, spots on TV and all that stuff. Now what you thinking? What are you going through? Now that your worst dream is coming true. Hey, hey! Your numbers are. I tried to tell you. Your numbers are. And I remember when you told me. I think the first song came too early in the piece relative to an audience buying into the characters and the story. Um, and so the, you know, the discomfort of seeing these characters in, in the midst of, of a major melodramatic action piece breaking into song I think really disrupted an audience's um, attention and commitment to what we were doing. And, you know, maybe if it had come five minutes later, it would have made a difference. I don't know. I mean, I tried to analyze it after the fact, and, you know, the best I could come up with was that people were embarrassed by it on a certain level, you know? It's one thing when you walk into a Broadway theater and the conventions of a Broadway musical being what they are, that's what you're going there for. And you're, you're part of a, an audience, a live audience, and you're in the dark, and, and the show is presented, and... and you know, My Fair Lady or, or whatever, whatever, West Side Story, you know, you, you come into the theater with a certain expectation. Well, no one had ever done anything like this television before. And, and you're not, it's not a communal experience. You're, you're not sitting with five, six, eight hundred people in a darkened theater uh, watching a stage production. You know, you're sitting at home drinking a beer in your underwear and the TV's over there in the corner, and and I just think in some weird way it made people uncomfortable. It's just sort of like, you know, your your Uncle Bernie gets loaded at Thanksgiving and starts <laughs> singing songs or something. This is your lucky day. We're going for Oh, oh, I'll make you perfect in every way.
those were techniques we'd evolved over the course of making Hill Street, you know, which was really for, for all of us on Cop Rock, Greg Hoblet, who directed the pilot and co-executive produced the series. We had over time developed these little techniques to, to try to enhance the emotional impact of a moment at the end of an act so that you didn't make that totally hard cut from, you know, this very emotional scene, bam, to selling cheese or something. You know, so that you just had that, that little, almost subliminal, transitional fade to black, you know, to let an audience kind of settle into the moment. We had evolved certain stylistic ways of doing things, you, you know, that I, I suppose in retrospect you, you could identify as signature elements of the shows. Could this be a face that someone Whatever the flaws were, either in the music or to whatever extent there were flaws, just as a cop show, uh, although I don't think you could separate the two, really. I don't think that's the reason it failed. I think it failed for much more fundamental reasons, um, having to do with an audience's unwillingness to embrace that experiment in television at that time. Uh, now, this is 25 plus years ago, you know, and, and since then we've had Glee and, and, and other shows that have really experimented with music and, and done interesting things. If we tried it today in, in this environment, I think it's a show you could probably pitch and sell today. Um, if, if we hadn't done it 25 years ago and fallen flat on our asses. Uh, because I think the way technology has, has advanced not only the making of television, but has completely changed the way people watch television. Um, you know, you could sit and binge watch Cop Rock if you wanted to. In two nights, easily. I th I, we only aired, I think, seven of them um, initially, and then it just was so dismal in its performance that, you know, they yanked it. I was as conscious of wanting to make a good cop show as I was of wanting to make a musical. How do I make the memories lay down and die? How do I say goodbye? Obviously, I'm in a very small minority of, 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 of people who really liked it. Uh, with, with, with all its flaws, whatever it was, I just thought it was such a great effort. And, but more than just the effort, I mean, everybody makes a great effort in success or failure. It's just, it's hard work making a television series and, and people work very, very hard to, to make them. Uh, but I, I, I just thought it was terrific, you know? I, whatever its flaws were, I just thought it was bold. I, it had never been done before. Um, I guess you could argue, well, now we know why, <laughs> you know? I can't believe they canceled us. Yeah, I know. I only got to sing one song. Two. 
Excuse me, one. No, two. You sang that one song here in the office, uh, what do you call it? How to Love a Woman, and uh, the song in the dream sequence where they hang me in my underwear. Yeah, but that was my song, that was Carl's. Oh, well, you still got to sing in it. I only got one song the whole time. Well, you're not really a singer. <laughs> what do you mean I'm not really a singer? I started in this business as a singer. This was a great job. Under normal circumstances, you make a show that the audience doesn't respond to particularly well, and you get canceled after 13 episodes. Cop Rock was such a spectacular failure in terms of ratings and dropping like a stone every week, and it was a very expensive show, that by episode four, everybody knew that this was a show that wasn't going to survive. Fox knew it. Uh, I, I'm, I knew it. I mean, I'm a realist. Uh, I've been in the business a long time. And so it really was a matter of uh, cutting our losses. If you come for me, better say your last goodbye. Cause a man who does is gonna be the man who dies. The network had an awful lot of money invested in this thing, and it was it was a busted investment. And you, you just, if you're gonna be a responsible producer, you have to acknowledge that. And we did, and we finished we finished our shows with the, with a certain amount of creative defiance, you know, and and that was it. <laughs> When they came to me and said, "Look, this is the circum, this is the situation we're facing. It's it's a very expensive show. It's not doing well at all. Or we're, we're you know we're hemorrhaging money." I had I had no argument to continue. Um, I'm a realist. I'm I'm a big boy. <laughs> yeah, or I'd been there before, and and. This was not like a show on the bubble. This was a show under the bubble. It was underwater. And, uh, you know, and, and, and so we just vowed to finish our episodes with a certain kind of delight, you know, that we weren't going to slink off the stage. We were going to, you know, be broad and theatrical to the to the last note. Well, I guess it ain't really over till the fat lady sings. It may not have been our best episode, but it was memorable because it was our last episode and it was called It Ain't Over Till the Fat Lady Sings. Responding to the fact that this was done. We, 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 we were essentially, we were out of gas, you know. Yeah, I was pretty far out, uh, you know, and I liked that episode. <laughs> it ain't over till the fat lady sings. Bye -bye, bye -bye, baby. Cop Rock was a gift that just kept on giving. I mean, people never let me alone about it. I, you, you know, for me, I, I was very disappointed in its failure, as I am with any show that I do that, that doesn't succeed. Maybe more so even with Cop Rock, because I, I thought it truly was, you know, an innovative attempt at, at, at something fresh. And every time something failed egregiously or had a musical element to it, you know, critics would invoke Cop Rock yet again. I mean, it's... It never stopped. It just never stopped. So, no, I'm not defensive about it. Uh, I'm proud of it. I always was. But if people hadn't sort of defined cop rock as, as 
almost iconic in its failure. Uh, you know, I would have just moved on, as I did, to other stuff. I think right after Cop Rock, we did a show called uh, Civil Wars that Billy Finkelstein wrote and, and Greg Hobbit and he were executive producers on. And while that was on, David Milch and I were developing NYPD Blue, which originally had been intended to go on the air in 1992. And we had so much uh, conflict with network censors about the content of the show that I pulled it. Uh, you know, I just wasn't going to comply with what they wanted, and they wouldn't air what we were insisting on. So it took an additional year before, you know, Bob and I were able to come to terms with what we were, what we were doing. I've got the plastic. I'm A-OK. Just write your ticket, fax it to my CD. I haven't seen Cop Rock in 25 years. I've never gone. I, I don't generally go back and look at my old stuff. Um, and I don't know, maybe it'll just embarrass the hell out of me, for all I know. I don't care. But um, all I do know is that over the course of the last 25 years, there has been a small segment of the viewing audience that loved it. And for years and years, I, I would get letters and still occasionally get, get, get notes from people saying, how can I get a hold of Cop Rock? You, you know, how can I access those episodes? And I would say, you know, write to 20th Century Fox or whatever. I mean, it's just, it's never been done. Um, so for those thimble full of enthusiasts, I'm glad this is going to be out there for them to, uh, you know, reminisce with. Yeah, yeah, yeah.